how do you see them as, first of all, even credibly trying to make such a statement, number one? <clears throat> and number two, why? Why do you think they're doing that? Um, well, those are interesting questions in which I could uh, expatiate for quite a while, but uh, let me take it apart this way. I'm an anthropologist, so my knowledge base is pretty broad for the whole world. Maybe it's shallow and broad, but it's broad. Um, and I try to think of societies that do not have or have not had a form of slavery and pretty much limited to a number of small scale hunter gatherer societies. Think of uh, Eskimos or uh, Kalahari Bushmen. Um, both of those are uh, terms that are now out of fashion, but essentially uh, people living hand to mouth are not likely to uh, want the burden of having to care for captive others. But beyond that uh, low level of social organization that characterizes a handful of societies, slavery is well nigh a universal institution, or has been. Um, all the societies that we know about in sub-Saharan Africa, in Asia, in Europe, uh, the Middle East, were at least at one point in their history founded on slavery. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of exploration of historical sources to come to an understanding of this. Now, American slavery doesn't differ in some profound way from uh, the slaveries that existed in other places. Well, uh, one way in which it differs is that its lifespan was pretty short from the uh, end of the 17th century when it got organized in the, United, in the colonies. Uh, to the end of the Civil War was the period of American slavery. Uh, another uh, way in which that it was limited was that through about three quarters of that time, it faced a domestic opposition, a, a rising uh, a movement to abolish the institution. Uh, that pressure back against slavery is very unusual. It's, that's the exceptionalism in America. There was a movement from the middle of the 18th century on to get rid of this thing. Uh, so why does the New York Times, why do Hannah Jones and other uh, figures adopting the, the voice of history, if not actually its methods, uh, want to insist that American slavery was a unique evil? Uh, the best case they can make, and I think it's important to go to their best case, is that uh, the existence of the institution ran counter to the announced principles, uh, at least the principles as they were laid forth by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. So you can catch America in a contradiction or an act of hypocrisy, they say, and that's what makes American slavery different from slavery elsewhere. Uh, I don't think there's much to that. I think we're going to hear uh, other well-informed people discussing this idea over the course of the week. Uh, but as a matter of fact, American slavery, uh, as bad as it was, was nowhere near as bad as, say, Aztec slavery, where the result was uh, having your heart ripped out on an altar in the middle of Cape Khan or something like that, uh, or slavery uh, uh, as an adjunct to human sacrifice, as it was practiced in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we're, we're left with a form of slavery that extracted labor from people but didn't generally see profit in killing them. Uh, so uh, that's the, the brief answer here. I think it is odd that uh, this misrepresentation of American slavery has caught on as much as it has, but we're going to be pushing back at this. But, but thank you for those questions. And Peter, welcome. We don't have your voice yet. There we go. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Thank you. Good to see you, Peter, and thanks for inviting me. Well, delighted to have you. Um, I'm going to give you a, a brief uh, semi-formal introduction. Um, well, it, it's my honor to have as our inaugural speaker at this conference, uh, Peter Kersenow. He's probably best known, at least to this audience, as a member of the US Civil Rights Commission. In fact, he's the longest serving such member, at least now serving, 
This is his fourth consecutive six-year term beginning last year. Now, that's important for a lot of reasons, but I think maybe most important because he brings a historical perspective to a body that sometimes, especially these days, acts as though civil rights is a form of improvisation uh, and that the commission is therefore free to make things up as it goes along. He's, he's the one of the members of the commission saying, no, that's not right. He knows otherwise. Uh, he is an attorney who received his JD cum laude from Cleveland Marshall College of Law in 1979. His BA is from Cornell University. He's been a practicing lawyer his entire career, currently serving as a partner in the Cleveland firm Benish, Friedlander, Copeland, and Aronoff, and as the firm's labor and employment group uh, director. He brings to that experience uh, the uh, experience of having served on the National Labor Relations Board for two years in 2006 and 2007, where he played a key role in several significant decisions. He's the past chair of the Blue Black Leadership. He served as an adjunct professor at his alma mater, Cleveland Marshall College of Law. And sometime in the last couple of years, he's managed to publish with a major press two action-packed thrillers, Target Omega and Second Strike. You can buy them on Amazon, I just checked. <laughs> um, now, I'm looking forward to the uh, edge of my seat account that he will give of racial oppression in American life in today's talk, which is the very DNA of the country. Um, I don't think it will be amiss if I add that this is my third attempt to introduce Mr. Carsonow to a National Association of Scholars event. The first two events failed, one literally on the runway, uh, the other when we had to cancel an event at Yale due to what could be summarized as security concerns. So he lives a life of danger, at least when it comes to NAS, but he's not like the uh, the secret agent man in the old Johnny Rivers song who from everyone he meets, he stays a stranger. He is to the contrary, a warm and convivial colleague with a deep understanding of the nation's racial discontents. Now, before I launch him at you, uh, I wanna say that if you have questions to ask, please send them to contact at NAS and we will transmit them. And uh, on with that, I welcome Peter. Thanks very much, Peter, and uh, good morning to everybody. Thank you very much for that uh, cordial introduction. A um, couple things. First, I want to apologize in advance. After our remarks, I won't have an opportunity to engage in a Q&A because in my day job, unfortunately, uh, I'm an employment lawyer. We have emergencies that arise, and so I have to address one uh, imminently. Uh, nonetheless, this is a very, very important topic, and I'm excited to be able to address this. I've addressed it in other forms before, it's becoming more and more urgent that this is something that um, I think it's an all hands on deck situation. I'm not a historian, I'm not a scholar, although I've, sometimes I play one on TV. Uh, and in this respect, I share something with Hannah Nicole Jones, who is the guiding force behind the New York Times version of the 1619 Project. That version, by the way, is metastasizing somewhat based on our best information. Uh, there's approximately 5,000 school districts who have adopted something like that. Here in my home state of Ohio, I'm involved in, a, in an effort to ensure that the 1619 project is not implemented within our state school systems, even though it appears as if the state school board is on the verge of doing just that, having passed a resolution promoting the 1619 project. It's just the first step. Um, I look at this from the standpoint of an amateur historian. I mean, you know, like everyone else, I took all the uh, supposed uh, American history courses in school. I do a copious amount of reading, obviously, and as a member of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights for nearly 20 years, I do glance by this issue from time to time. Um, so in, in that respect, what amazed me and bothered me when the 1619 Project was first announced over a year ago, uh, when I first saw it, I knew immediately that this was something that needed to be addressed by folks such as, as this, because we have seen the consequences of some version, maybe not a formal version of the 1619 Project, 
Uh, but with critical race theory of, la of the late 80s forward to the present and other scout, well, I don't even, I hate to call it scholarship, but the Howard Zinn version of history, we have seen what I believe to be a corruption of, of history, a distortion of history. Again, Jones is using the tools of a 20th century form of oppression to consciously or not present her version of, and that of many on the left, uh, version of slavery in the United States. And it is nothing more than sheer propaganda. It's, it's very ironic that they are using those tools that we've seen throughout much of the 20th century employed in some of the most repressive regimes to give this glowing account of uh, the, the, the valiant travails of Blacks in America. And there were valiant uh, uh, tra travails of Blacks in America, but they give it primacy that's not at all supported by the facts. So we've seen in the last week and a half, two weeks or so, even the President of the United States has weighed in on this controversy. We see executive orders that have been prepared, not necessarily directly with respect to the 1619 Project, although he's made some noise about defunding schools uh, related to that. I haven't seen any executive orders issue uh, or anything from OCR. Maybe it has, but I've just not seen it yet. That would indicate um, that that's going to happen. He's also indicated that um, he has issues with critical race theory training at federal agencies and by federal contractors. I think that's an outstanding first step. So last year when the 1619 Project was implemented, uh, the newspaper of record, the newspaper of record, um, having, by the way, blown the history with respect to Walter Durante and the Ukraine famine, decides to take on this project. Um, they stated that it was going to be an ongoing initiative that aims to, quote, reframe the country's history, right there, reframe the country's history by placing the consequences of slavery and contributions of Black Americans at the very center of our national narrative. Now, placing Black Americans at the very center of our national narrative, is that objectionable? Um, no. Is it ahistorical? Well, um, I think it overemphasizes, unfortunately, uh, the contributions of Black Americans for a number of years, and we'll get to that in a moment. But what it is, it's a conscious attempt to make the country's, quote, real founding stem from when the first American slaves arrived in Virginia, as opposed to, for example, you know, 1620 when the Pilgrims arrived or 1607 when Jamestown was, colonized, was, was settled. And instead of fixing the founding of the country on a constructive event, the New York Times decides to define the Uni United States by one of its signal failures, or maybe its signal failure. So the 1619 Project, it deliberately minimizes the contributions and cultures of white Americans and magnifies and romanticizes the contributions and culture of black Americans. It's a sort of historical reparations. Ironically, uh, in this way, it's the inverse of, look, I'm, I'm an old man. I remember the textbooks from the late 50s, 60s, 70s, and I knew because I read more broadly perhaps than what our curriculum, uh, what our reading list was like that, you know, there were a lot of things omitted in the standard text back then. So in this way, the 1619 Project is the inverse of what was occurring, at least in my experience, in the, 15, uh, in the 50s and 60s with respect to textbooks, omissions of contributions of Blacks. And in the introductory essay, Henry Cole Jones writes, quote, more than any other group in this country's history, we have served generation after generation in an overlooked but vital role. It is we who have been the perfectors of this democracy." End quote. Uh, that's, let's, let's face it, that's, uh, to put it mildly, overheated rhetoric. Uh, unfortunately, it'd be nice if that were true, but it's not true. It's inaccurate. It's propaganda. Maybe it's kind of feel-good propaganda, but it's propaganda nonetheless. And later, she says, quote, out of our unique isolation, both from our native cultures and from white America, we forged this nation's most significant original culture. Now, that, that's defensible. That's defensible. Um, but what the two phrases joined try to impart is this feeling as if 
the suppression of black Americans was something that um, nonetheless failed to prevent black Americans from being the organizing population in this country's history. Now, what this has done is it's, it's been in the zeitgeist for a while now. We see some of the consequences of this in the streets over the last three months, but it's influenced even reasonable people to make ridiculous claims supporting the notion that whites have repeatedly snatched from blacks, and this has happened. Now, look, whites have taken credit for some things that blacks have done, but it wasn't at the core of the American experiment. Um, some of the achievements, for example, uh, a few days ago, somebody named Joe Biden, who you might recognize as um, um, somebody who's been in public office for a short period of time, uh, said that, quote, a black man invented the light bulb, not a white guy named Edison, end quote. Now, um, maybe he's reading different texts than I am. And I will admit that there were occasions in which people of various races made contributions that weren't acknowledged. But this is simply untrue. A man named Louis Lattimore had done some great work to perfect some of the filaments related to the light bulb, made some improvements upon it, uh, but Edison invented the light bulb. So Biden's alternate universe might be a silly example of the kind of thing that the 1619 Project promotes, but it demonstrates how the effort to put race and slavery at the heart of the American story has the potential to destabilize our understanding of our country, our country's self-conception. The project's obsession with race standing alone is bad enough, but as I said at the outset, what makes it worse is this is something that's being introduced into curriculum K through 12. It's one thing when you do it in college, and maybe somebody's already had an established foundation, a student has, to adequately interpret what they're being told. But when fresh young minds are exposed to this, that's something completely different. So as with other progressive revisionism, it's likely then when you start at K through 12, that this will become the story of the American founding or the story of America within a generation, unless there's significant pushback. And again, that means all hands on deck. It can't be just a discrete and insular group of people who do this because we're facing, unfortunately, um, much if not most of the academy, you may know that better than I do, I just see these folks appearing before the Civil Rights Commission and for a number of years, the essence of the 1619 Project is being spewed forth at the US Commission on Civil Rights and adopted almost uncritically by many of my, my colleagues. Um, fortunately, we've got respected and accomplished historians of American history who've publicly addressed the manifold inaccuracies of the 1619 Project. And we're not just talking about historians that are in a particular niche or you know, have a particular affinity for the lost cause or anything of that nature. As part of the National Association of Scholars 1620 Project, Lucas Morell has written about Hannah Jones' essay regarding the 1619 Project, quote, and this goes to the, that, the point I just made about the snatching of credit from blacks and, or, and giving it to whites. The strangest thing about the essay is the claim that transplanted Africans and their descendants were the key to American greatness. Hannah Jones cites no African principles of self-government or ideals of humanity when she quotes the famous pronouncements of the Declaration of Independence. She merely asserts that, subquote, Black Americans, as much as those men cast in alabaster in the nation's capital, are the nation's true, subquote, founders. Ironically, however, even in this warped retelling, Black Americans' principal means of saving white Americans from the worst selves was not anything African, but the quintessentially American ideals of human equality and natural rights. Precisely right. Claiborne Carson, a professor of history at Stanford who was chosen by Coretta Scott King to oversee the publication of Martin Luther King Jr.'s papers, commented that the idea of of human rights was, as I think 
look again, I'm not a historian, but what I learned is this is an enlightenment ideal that originated with white men. I don't think they thought about this in terms of this is white enlightenment. I don't think most of us would even think about it in terms of something peculiar to whites. This was a universally human enlightenment. Uh, nonetheless, black people became aware of the discussions related to the enlightenment and these, and these ideas that were percolating throughout the founding and said, well, look, we've got rights too. But as Morrell said, these ideas originated from Western, meaning white Western, in this case, specifically American, if not Anglo culture. And when were then adopted by black Americans who were brought to this continent from Africa. There's nothing peculiarly African about these ideals and they didn't originate in that continent. That's important. Those are facts. It's not a function of propaganda. The 1619 Project reserves almost all of its, and there's considerable amount of opprobrium, but it reserves almost all of its opprobrium toward civilization to, for the United States. Nicole Jones says in her essay, quote, those men and women who came ashore on that August day were the beginning of American slavery. This is uh, 1619. They were among the 12.5 million Africans who would be kidnapped from their homes and brought in chains across the Atlantic Ocean in the largest forced migration in human history until the Second World War. Before the abolishment of the international slave trade, 400,000 enslaved Africans would be sold into America, 400,000. That's a lot. But think about that. She says that almost 2 million slaves didn't survive the Middle Passage. So approximately 10.5 million slaves survived to make it to the New World. 400,000 of them, she says, were sold into slavery in America. And again, I'm using her figures. Uh, and I know that there are other figures out there, but I'm using hers. So she says 400,000 of the 10.5 million were sold into slavery in America, meaning North America, meaning what became the United States or the infant United States. But that begs the question, what happened to the remaining 10 million? Answer, well, at least 4 million of them, we know, ended up in Brazil which is not part of the United States of America. Last time I checked, even though, you know, I'm looking at my, I've got my little atlas here. Sometimes it's, you know, make difficult to discern between Brazil and the United States. Slavery in Brazil, you might remember, wasn't ended until 1888, even later than the United States and Nicole Hannah-Jones and the progenitors and the supporters of the 1619 Project give the United States all kinds of hell for the fact that it was dilatory in abolishing slavery. Do we want slavery? Did we want slavery abolished sooner? Sure. But we also understand how history works, how mankind works, how humans work. She doesn't seem angry, by the way, at the Africans who sold their fellow Africans into slavery. All her anger seems to be directed toward the United States. And obviously, that gives away the game. Now, it makes sense that that Nicole Jones as an American would concentrate on the United States of America. She's doing this for the New York Times, not the Rio de Janeiro Times. Um, but it, the, the focus is myopic and it is in essence anti-white. Um, it has anti-white rage suffused throughout and it prevents her from having a perspective or sense of proportion with respect to slavery. I know that there are a number of people who think that any discourse related to slavery shouldn't have any kind of perspective, uh, that it is a unique evil and that you should recoil from it. There's no middle ground. You get that from an emotional perspective, but that's not a scholarly perspective. It's not an intelligent perspective and it doesn't inform where we are as a society today and where we should be going. So you know, we know slavery, I think Peter was, was referencing it earlier on as an anthropologist, slavery was prevalent in most of the world for, for millennia. Um, it wasn't unique to the United States of America. In fact, um, what became the United States of America was frankly a little bit late to the game. 
It was common in the Western Hemisphere. It predated the arrival of Europeans, um, to say nothing of slavery in Europe, in the Middle East, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and despite the numerous cruelties of chattel slavery, the African population here in the United States somehow grew dramatically from natural increases. Now, as I mentioned, Hannah Nicole Jones says that nearly 400,000 slaves were imported to the colonies and into the what's now became the infant United States. And, and think about those numbers because it says something about their own calculations. And again, this is not to diminish the horrors of slavery or to excuse anything. This is a matter of perspective. Perspective is important no matter what horrors we may be talking about because we want to get it accurately because it informs the manner in which we deal with these similar matters now and in the future. If we get it wrong, we're gonna get everything wrong or much wrong. So 400,000 are, are imported. By the time of the 1860 census, however, there were almost 4 million slaves in the United States and nearly half a million free blacks. So the injustice and cruelty of slavery didn't extinguish the African-American population, um, but it, the African-American population, while you can't say thrive is the wrong word necessarily, but it grew significantly, even during the antebellum period. Um, it describes a population that grew from 400,000 to five, four to five million, as Herbert Klein and Ben Vincent note in African slavery, in Latin America and the Caribbean, the life expectancy of slaves mirrored the life expectancy of the free population among whom they lived. Now, when they say mirrored, I, I took a look at this and mirror may be, it's not a precise word, but what it means is that the range of life expectancy wasn't markedly different according to them. They write, quote, Although the contemporaries and later commentators have speculated endlessly about the life expectancy of slaves, it is apparent that it was not that different from that of the free populations in the societies in which they lived. The average life expectancy of native-born Latin American slaves was in the low 20s. This contracts with a U.S. slave life expectancy rate in the mid-30s. But in both cases, the slave rates reflected local free population rates with free Latin Americans having a lower life expectancy than did free North Americans. The life expectancy of US whites in 1850 was 40 years, whereas the total slave and free Brazilian population in 1872 had a life expectancy of 27 years. Nevertheless, it should not be forgotten that slaves were almost exclusively a working class population though their sanitation and housing in rural areas was probably better than those of the average subsistence free farm family, their food consumption was probably little better than that of the poorest elements of society. There's little doubt they were at the worst levels in every society in which they lived. Now, why do I mention this demographic information? It sounds callous and harsh in many respects. Again, facts are facts. Facts don't um, become non-facts simply because they are bracing or harsh, but it's merely to provide some perspective. Throughout her essay, Jones uses overwrought inflammatory language to describe slavery. Again, a horrific institution, but she even manages to go beyond that, or the 1619 Project even goes beyond that and, and tends to distort things. It could make a much more uh, uh, greater impact if it stayed within the confines of accuracy and the truth. But she attempts to portray American history as a long struggle between racist, oppressive whites and valiant noble blacks. That's how everyone's characterized. And that's not how human beings behave. She writes, for example, quote, they, meaning slaves, could be worked to death and often were to produce the highest profits for the white people who owned them. Now, I have no doubt that that occasionally occurs, but, um, and it did occur, and there was no doubt that this was cruel, even if there were no physical cruelty visited upon slaves in any particular instance. But working a slave, an asset to death, happened, but not necessarily the best way to make a buck. Um, given that the life expectancies of slaves were similar to those of free whites, either 
being worked to death wasn't common or everyone black and white was being worked to death at the time. Now it's probably a little bit of both. Were any one of us transported to 1850, I'm sure we would think that, boy, these conditions are pretty horrific. Hannah Jones also criticizes the framers of the Constitution, of course, for among other things, not outlawing importation of slaves for 20 years and for allowing Congress to mobilize troops to put down slave revolts. Now, rather than seeing the at least improvements or positive trends that the framers set a date certain for ending the slave trade, she blames them for not ending it immediately, as I said a little bit earlier. Now, historian Gordon Wood said, and I quote, the first anti-slavery meeting in the history of the world takes place in Philadelphia in 1775. Human beings are complex things. 13 years after that meeting, the new Americans agreed to end the import of slaves in 1808. And it'd be 19 years before Britain decided to end her involvement in the transatlantic slave trade, thus ending the British slave trade months before the American slave trade ended. And Gordon Wood also notes that during the revolution and framing of the constitution, many people thought that slavery was on its last legs and ending the transatlantic slave trade would put slavery on the road to extinction. Well, we know they were wrong, but predictions are tough things. You know, back in the 1990s, we all thought that the economic development in China would cause it to abandon uh, its totalitarianism, its communism, and embrace democracy, but we were wrong about that. It's also remarkable that uh, the 1619 Project promotes or believes that it was illegitimate to grant Congress the power to quell slave revolts. Okay, get that, all right? The lone successful slave revolt, as we all know, or at least uh, there were perhaps two, but the famous one was the Nat Turner Rebellion, and it was pretty, pretty bloody, no doubt about it. Turner's followers, quote, launched a campaign of total annihilation, murdering, murdering Travis, his owner, and his family in their sleep, and then setting forth on a bloody march toward Jerusalem. In two days and nights, about 60 white people were ruthlessly slain, end quote. Um, on the other hand, maybe it makes sense that Hannah Jones said that it would be an honor for the riots that are currently destroying many of our cities across the country be known as the 1619 riots. Um, no, it wouldn't be an honor. Uh, it wouldn't be an honor for any riots. It was, it was bad to quell slave revolts uh, because the institution of slavery should have been abandoned earlier in a perfect world in a, world in a peaceful fashion. But saying that in 2020, after we have a black president, black CEOs, lawful discrimination has been outlawed for 60 years. There are discrete instances of racism and discrimination, no doubt, but this country has done incredible, pro has, has incredible progress in eliminating vestiges of discrimination. To say that we should call this the 1619 riots I'm just going to reserve comment on that. I, I, let me just say that I think when you hear commentators and politicians throughout the land speak favorably about these riots, that says a lot about them um, and says absolutely nothing about the history of this country. What the pro proponents of 1619 seem to fail to grasp is that you can both oppose slavery and racial injustice and also hope not to have your property destroyed or being murdered in your bed, such as those individuals during the Nat Turner Rebellion. But let's return to some of the errors and omissions in the 1619 Project and the Jones essay. She writes that the Supreme Court enshrined white supremacy in law in the Dred Scott decision. I know many of you are intimately familiar with the Dred Scott decision as a member of the Civil Rights Commission. Obviously, this is something that I've looked at for a long, long time back when I was a student, but even today. So this is what they write about the Dred Scott decision. Quote, this belief that black people were not merely enslaved, but were a slave race became the root of the endemic racism that we still cannot purge from this nation to this day. If black people could not ever be citizens, if they were cast apart from all humans, 
Then they did not require the rights bestowed by the Constitution. And the, quote, we in the, quote, we the people was not a lie. Uh, yet, you know, you've got a lot of folks, historian uh, from Oxford, um, Carradine said, is not the case that all white Americans thought that African Americans were excluded. And all you have to do is just have a glancing familiarity with the history of that period. He says, quote, what's really striking addressing this notion, however, is what Lincoln positively demands for blacks at this time, the 19 or the 1850 election. He embraces them with the Declaration of Independence's proposition that all men are created equal by all men. He means regardless of color. And that's where he gets into a tussle with Douglas. Douglas insists that the Declaration of Independence was never intended to apply to black people. And of course, Lincoln is emphatic that it does. So for me, this is Carradine. It's what Lincoln claims for black people that is striking and not what he says he will deny them. So then the essay then skips from 1857 when Dred Scott's handed down to 1862. And so doing, they lead the reader of the essay to believe that the Dred Scott decision reflected the consensus of white Americans at the time, again, in 1862. And you'd never guess from her essay that the decision ignited a public firestorm, okay? It wasn't simply accepted as given, <clears throat> excuse. And, and it, 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 the firestorm was obviously among free white Americans and Lincoln denounced the decision, expansion of slavery into the territories and slavery itself in his famous house divided speech. Lincoln denounced Douglas saying, quote, he has done all in his power to reduce the whole question of slavery to one of a mere property right. By implication, Lincoln himself believed that the question of slavery was more than mere right of property. As an avowed opponent of slavery, Lincoln was elected to the presidency two years later. If Dred Scott represented the consensus of white Americans at the time, it's likely he wouldn't be elected. As Lincoln said earlier in the House Divided speech, quote, we are now far into the fifth year since the policy was initiated with the avowed object and confident premise, putting an end to slavery agitation. Under the operation of that policy, that agitation has not only not ceased, but has constantly augmented. In my opinion, it will not cease until a crisis shall have been reached and passed. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in the course of ultimate extinction, extinction or its advocates will push it forward till it shall become alike lawful in all states, old as well as new, north as well as south. Now, the 1619 project skips over all of this, skips over that five year interval of increasing public conflict over slavery um, that culminated in the Civil War. And of course, they focus on 1816, uh, 1862 just in time for the meeting between Lincoln and black leaders in which he proposed, and this is a significant part of the 1619 Project essay, he proposes that African-Americans emigrate to Africa under a colonization plan. Um, that is one of purportedly ori uh, Lincoln's original sins. But again, Carradine said, in this exchange with black leaders, it should be seen in the context in which it took place again. Context is very important. We can't measure things properly from the standpoint of 2020 sensibilities. Well, nobody wants to mention anything or measure anything from 2020 because we want to get out of here as soon as possible. But in 1862, the Union's fortunes were bleak and Lincoln himself was under a lot of strain at the time. Cardin said, quote, Lincoln's message to them has to be seen also in the context of the daunting perspective challenge of embracing 4 million slaves fully into the American polity, end quote. It's noteworthy when 
Lincoln proposed a constitutional amendment that would gradually emancipate slaves and compensate slave owners while also refet resettling former slaves in Africa that the amendment didn't go anywhere, okay? Quote, Cornelius Cole, who took office as representative from California on March 4, 1863, recollected more accurately that Lincoln's amendment proposal, quote, recognized the ownership of the master to his slave. And because many members of Congress could not agree with him on this, it, quote, received no consideration by Congress. Again, that's fully at odds with what the 1619 project contends is almost a universal acceptance and resistance of slavery and resistance to the abolishment thereof. And somehow that the Dred Scott decision reflected the consensus of Americans, free Americans at the time. Again, there are manifold, multiple distortions of history that all go one way. The, that's, that's important, I think, that we see that where there is emphasis, where there is a lack of emphasis, where there is distortion, where there are mistakes, all of them within the essay, all of them within the confines of the 1619 project seem to go only in one direction. And it's an anti-American direction. And the subtext also is an anti-white narrative. Um, that's not history. That's propaganda, and it's malignant propaganda. We have not had this kind of narrative as prominently featured as it is now in our schools, in media, in, um, in all forms of media, whether it be entertainment media or otherwise. We haven't had it in this perspective in a long, long time. And I think that even though we've had some version of this pursuant to critical race theory for at least the last 30 plus years, uh, it hasn't been this overt, this adamant, and that presents significant challenges. So let's think about this for a minute. Lincoln proposed what might be a rambling and ill-considered proposal to attempt to end the war, gradually free, free the slaves and tackle the quote race problem that loomed in the public mind at the time and his fellow Republicans were committed to belief that slaves must be freed immediately. Yet, a person can't have property that they were unwilling to seriously consider Lincoln's proposal, even if it might have saved hundreds of thousands of white lives in a civil war. Again, this puts into considerable doubt, and I'm using that, that term charitably, the premise of the 1619 Project, which maintains that not only was slavery an inarguable wrong, but everyone who was white in America, or at least a large number of whites in America, embraced that wrong for their own benefit and had no compunction about it and wanted to seek to contain and re receive those benefits over a long term. I think uh, I've been rambling for quite some time now, and I do have to get to my emergency. I just want to say that um, thanks again for having me. I think the 1619 Project, along with more broadly critical race theory, um, is one of the most significant attempts to propagandize history that we have seen in at least my lifetime. And it's been lurking in the weeds for a while. You know, we've seen some elements of it, but now we have it full-throated and it's being shoved down our throats with the willing assistance of many in the academy and definitely many in the media. And of course, uh, politicians who find that it is politically useful. I would just simply close by saying that I'm urging everybody, and I know I'm speaking to or preaching to the choir here, to say that every opportunity that we have, um, without being pejorative about it, although I, I acknowledge that I've done so in this presentation to some extent because I'm that inflamed by this, but we need to resist this 
uh, as strongly as we possibly can, because this goes to undermining the very notion of what it means to be American, and this has untold effects for the future. Peter, thanks very much for having me. Thank you, Peter, for being here and for a terrific talk. I think you set the, the table for this, this whole week to come. I don't want to hold you back from the fires or the emergencies that you're about to deal with, but um, we're so fortunate to have you here to lead off the conference. So my, my gratitude and that of our listeners. And, Thanks, um, Peter, and I hope to rejoin at some point in the week. Good. Um, for those of you who are watching, uh, remember that at uh, 3 p.m. today, Eastern Time, we have the uh, panel on absences from the 1619 Project's history. It will be moderated by Tom Lindsay, distinguished senior fellow of higher education and constitutional studies at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Uh, the panelists are John Stouffer, the president of uh, professor of English American studies and African American studies at Harvard, speaking on the white abolitionist tradition, and Diana Schaub, professor of political science at Loyola University, Maryland, talking about Frederick Douglass. I look forward to seeing you back at three. Bye-bye.